Hi, I'm Deepak Prabhakara, co-founder and CEO of Boxy HQ, uh, an open source startup that is building developer tools for enterprise readiness. We help your startup get enterprise ready in just a few lines of code. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you uh, about security and sort of my learnings of security as a software developer over the last two decades. And my talk is titled, All Engineers are Security Engineers. So just, uh, just, to, uh, just a little bit of background on myself so you, you get the context of who I am and where I come from. Um, very much a developer, a technologist. Uh, I started my career in the early 2000s before cloud, before app store happened. Uh, very different days to you know what we have today. I had to actually go into data centers and, and get the hardware ready before getting started with software. Um, and I've moved in and out of startups and worked at slightly bigger companies as well, uh, notably Opera Software and Thomson Reuters. Uh, and most recently, before starting Boxy HQ, I was the CTO at a cybersecurity startup here in London. Uh, and I've, I've, over, over, the, over the two decades, I've done a lot of different types of developer roles as well. I've done, done a bit of front end, full stack, uh, but predominantly my strength is back end and scaling. So just to recap what this talk is uh, attempts to capture, uh, I'll talk about why software security has become so important today. Uh, and we'll also talk about why security is moving closer to the development lifecycle. Uh, developers can no longer you know, stay away from not having to do security. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, why that has happened. Uh, and I'll try and give you some examples of some common pitfalls in security while specifically while building software. It's something uh, as developers always face. Um, and finally, you sort of you know wanted to de demystify security and compliance uh, because there's there's a certain amount of you know uh, uh, myths around it, and I'd like to just sort of uh, demystify that for everybody. So as developers, we're, we're very familiar with this. You know, our main role, so to speak, day-to-day -day activities is, is really debugging, right? Um, we, we are solving problems and there's constantly problems to be tackled. Um, and there was a saying that I heard, which is very funny and very accurate, where, uh, where debugging is like being the detective in a crime movie where you're also the murder, uh, murderer. Uh, this has happened to me as well, right? When I started off, I did not know much about this. Uh, as my experience grew, I started to see that I myself was committing a lot of, you know, these mistakes that came back to haunt me um, as, a, as a software developer. So I'm hoping to capture some of those lessons and then um, show you how that ties back to security, how simple things can sort of lead to uh, security issues. So, uh, so just to recap on what we've seen in the last two decades. So when I started my career, uh, there was no real DevOps role. Um, you know, there was infrastructure roles, uh, uh, um, you know, roles that sort of focused very much, sysadmin typically, who focused on infrastructure and uh, scaling hardware for you. And this typically happened in data centers. Um, and then what happened was the, you know, the whole cloud revolution happened, AWS came about, uh, you could set up your, your hardware in, in just a few clicks. Uh, and what that initially meant was, you know, developers could then focus on their development activities, didn't have to worry too much about hardware and scaling hardware. Uh, and then DevOps sort of came about because you sort of had to bridge that gap. Um, and, you know, then sort of, your, your pipeline became developers responsible for building, then there was a deployment phase, and then you, know, you went into production. So as DevOps happened, uh, you know, uh, developers were able to release software a lot quicker than they normally could. Uh, but this obviously meant you know, security was sort of lagging behind because you know, you, the rate of deployment sort of uh, went up very quickly. So, so over the last few years, what we've seen is uh, developers are becoming more and more responsible for security because the sooner you can bake in security as a company into the development lifecycle, the quicker you can catch these security risks and overall security can be improved. So what used to be traditionally a separated role, uh, developers are today seeing you know, more and more of that being thrown back at them. 
Uh, and this is a good thing, right? Because this is exactly what happened with, uh, with the whole infrastructure as code. Uh, and we are now seeing this with you know, compliance and security. Um, and this is going, to, uh, they call it the shift left security, which effectively means you know, security is moving closer to your development lifecycle inside your CI CD pipelines. Um, and, and that's for very specific reasons. The number of vulnerabilities have increased. Uh, you know, today, uh, you, you constantly hear this, right? There was log4j that happened. So your software supply chain as such, the risks have in, uh, increased tremendously. Um, and DevSecOps now is, uh, it took a while for this to catch on, but I think this term is now quite popular. It effectively means, you know, to DevOps, you've added security now. So not only are developers doing, you know, DevOps, but also security on top of that. Uh, but there's plenty of tooling available today. So, so you know, it's, it's not, you're not completely on your own in that, in that respect. So I want to throw out a very controversial question. I think, you know, everybody thinks about this. Uh, can we really have software that is 100% secure? Uh, and actually the answer is yes, but it is extremely costly to, to you know, get to that phase. Um, so in practical, in a practical sense, it's really not possible, right? You, you have to constantly evolve your software um, to become more and more secure. And as, and the catch 22 is that as you're adding more of that, you tend to become, you know, less secure. So it's, it's, it's a constant uh, cat and mouse game to catch up with any vulnerabilities that might have opened up. Uh, and there's multiple reasons for this. So uh, there's inherent complexity today. So there's a lot of tooling, there's a lot of frameworks, a lot of choice as a developer, but that has introduced a lot of complexity. You know, what do you choose? How do these components interact with each other? Who's actually building it? Open source is very popular. Uh, you know, are these third party uh, libraries being maintained well? Are they keeping up to date with security? Uh, as a developer, when you start off, you don't have the security experience. Uh, you're also battling, you know, constantly changing requirements, which are sometimes incomplete as a fast moving startup. Uh, and this is very natural again, you know, that's why it's a startup. Uh, and of course, unlike bigger companies, startups uh, cannot really prioritize security too much unless they absolutely have to. And that sort of, you know, brings it to a place where you, you try to do security only as needed. Um, and that's, that's perfectly okay as well, because you know, that's, that's the evolution of software. We, we've seen that software is eaten the world. Uh, and now of course, every company has realized that they need to focus on security, make that a top priority. Um, so now just sort of moving into some security basics uh, that everybody should know of. Uh, uh, some of you would, would you know, be quite familiar with these things, but uh, as a way of sort of you know, just introducing to these, to these concepts. Um, information security is sort of dictated by the CIA triad. Uh, you know, has nothing to do with the, the US agency. Uh, it, they also sometimes call it AIC triad just to sort of you know, take that CIA reference away. Uh, but that's effectively confidentiality, integrity, availability. Uh, and what this means is to protect your information, you need these three um, pillars sort of laid out. Um, and most information security policies are sort of centered around these three pillars. So confident, confidentiality is very simply protecting the data. So you have some important data, you know, typically customers' data. You don't want it out there. Uh, so you need to protect access to it. You probably want to uh, encrypt it because you know, even if it was stolen, nobody has the keys to, to figure out what is inside there. Uh, so confidentiality is predominantly access control and encryption. Uh, integrity, you want to be sure that the data that was transferred to you uh, is actually what it is. And once you store it, it is what was originally stored. So that's typically you know, signatures, hashing, uh, and those sort of primitives to sort of make sure uh, the data is what it was. Uh, and finally, availability. If your data is not accessible, it's as good as you know, not, you know, not, not having um, uh, any kind of service or product. 
So availability is extremely important. So how do you safeguard your data against uh, you know, data losses, disasters, uh, and also attacks, of course. Uh, so this, th this includes things like resiliency. How is your system resilient to sort of making sure the data you've collected uh, simply cannot be lost? Um, and then cryptography is a, is a key component of security. So there's various ways to achieve cryptography, um, typically encryption. The most common method is a secret key. You have a secret key, uh, which you keep secret, and you use that to encrypt your data. And then you store what is called a ciphertext. Um, public key is effectively a public and private key combination, where you keep the private key a secret, and you, you encrypt it with um, with that, but then uh, so there's a two there's a two layered encryption there, private and public key. But then you can give out your public key, which can then be used to decrypt your data that was encrypted with your private key. Uh, and that's typically how, for example, TLS or SSL works. Um, that's encryption in transit, effectively uh, between the browser and the server. Uh, and hashes. Uh, this is typically a one-way function where um, you don't necessarily need to go back to what is, uh, you cannot recover data from a hash. Uh, it's very difficult. So you don't necessarily need to get access to the original data, but you probably want to compare that with data that's coming in without actually storing uh, that, that data as is in your system. So hashes achieve that. Uh, you've got, let's say for example, um, a password is a classic example. You don't want to store password in plain text ever. So you hash it. Um, and then when you're comparing a login from a user, you take the entered password, hash it, and then compare the hashes. Uh, principle of least privilege. It's uh, the idea is that in terms of access control and um, uh, you know, uh, sort of the permissions around it, you want to give the least possible permissions or privileges to, to people uh, around data and systems. Uh, so as an example, you don't want everyone to access your production systems. Uh, you want to heavily guard that only administrators or, you know, sort of your, your senior engineers need access to the full system. Uh, and then you want to safeguard access control depending on uh, the different roles within your organization. Um, and finally, as a developer, you definitely need to know the OWASP uh, top 10 vulnerabilities. So OWASP is, a, uh, is an organization that sort of captures predominantly web vulnerabilities. Um, and extremely, extremely important to sort of be on top of uh, what these are and how you how you want to safeguard your application against it. So every year uh, or you know every two three years, there's constantly changing this list. Uh, they're looking at all the vulnerabilities that happen and which ones are sort of you know most susceptible uh, for you as a company. Um, and predominantly focused on you know web applications, which is uh, what we are all typically building today. Um, so. One, one big piece of advice that you'll constantly hear as well, and it sometimes is a bit ambiguous, is you, know, you do not roll out your own cryptography. Uh, and what this effectively means is uh, go with you know, best practices, industry standards in terms of encryption, uh, decryption, and you know, those sort of things, because you, uh, it might be fun to sort of you know, try a, a few things, but it's very easily broken if there's not enough research put, put behind it. So you always want to sort of follow what the community does. There's a lot of security researchers doing this for us today. Uh, they're looking at you know, various uh, protocols and standards and when that breaks and what's coming up next. So you'd rather just follow that uh, and not try to make it your own, uh, your own cryptographic techniques. Uh, you want to do it for fun, for, for learning, but never in production. So just keep that away from production. Uh, and go with your, for example, if you're doing encryption, you want to go with your standard AES 256 bit encryption, because that's uh, that's known to resist, you know, most attacks that that are possible today. Uh, and of course, that might change, but you will have enough uh, lead time to sort of uh, 
make changes to 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 move on to the next protocol. Uh, passwords, I think this is a classic example. Even the biggest companies in the world have done this, and I think they still continue to do it, which is uh, which is not very really nice. Uh, which is storing plain text passwords. So you enter your password, it gets stored directly in the database. That's a, just a bad idea because you know you never want to reveal. Uh, a password to anybody, uh, not even an admin, right, in a, in a company. Um, so the most common technique, of course, that should be followed is it should be hashed. Uh, you never want to encrypt passwords either, because while it sounds like an interesting thing to do, if your encryption key is leaked, so is your password. Uh, so hashes is the best way because you can never come back to the, the actual password. Uh, of course, you don't want to use fast hashes because the idea is to prevent, uh, you know, password attacks. So the slower the hash, the better, which basically means that it becomes impossible to do brute force attacks on your system um, and, and, and basically guess password. Uh, you want to use a salt because the same password for different users should not end up with the same hash. Uh, that's a security vulnerability as well because then they could use the other one to log in as another user. So you want to use something called a salt, which is effectively a random um, character set that gets added to the, to the password when you, um, when you hash it. And the beauty about hashes is a small change in the original text and the hash is completely different. So that's why the salt is added so that it, it gives it a bit of variation and you end up with a different hash altogether. So, so the beauty of hashes is that uh, it's 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 one way. So um, you uh, you cannot get back the original text uh, from a from a hash. So even if you were attacked and lost your um, data, nobody can actually get back to the original password. Um, and that's why uh, and, and and that's why you want to always hash it and never encrypt a password. Um, and you also want to use a salt. This is extremely important because if uh, multiple users have the same password, you don't want to end up with the same hash because that opens up a uh, possibility for a security attack. You could impersonate another user if you knew that this is happening. Uh, so you want to use a salt, which is effectively just a random um, a cryptographically safe string that gets attached to, to your original password. Uh, and the great thing about hashes then is that if uh, if the original character original string changes, then uh, so does the hash. So even for small variations in the original string, the hash is completely different. Uh, so that's why salting is extremely important uh, and is a is a must do. Uh, and OWASP recommends uh, these four hashing algorithms and. You're, you're better off sticking to those, uh, you know, predominantly because they they are the right set of hashes for um, for use with the password. The slow, you can have multiple rounds of of you know hashing, so you can slow it down even further. Uh, and they're they're essentially cryptographically secure. So bcrypt is the most common uh, hashing technique for passwords. Uh, you should use that where you can. Uh, the other ones are S-Script. Argon2 is quite a new one. And it's becoming very popular. Uh, and PBKDF2 is a very specific one. Um, if you need so something that's called a FIPS 140 specification from, from the US government, uh, this is typically if you're selling into US government, uh, then, you, then you definitely need to do a PBKDF2. So it's not very common uh, for you know very specific purposes. So bcrypt is usually the way to go about passwords. Uh, the other very common you know uh, uh, vector for attacks on a web application is uh, input fields. So you know every application has that extremely important. If you do not validate the input, if you do not sanitize the inputs, then uh, that opens up a whole range of uh, injection attacks. You know all the way from databases, SQL. Uh, down to you know cross-site scripting on your on your web application itself, where attackers could potentially run uh, their own scripts on your on your web application and steal data on the back of that. And in a very similar for, uh, way, whatever you return from your server, your output uh, for API requests for your know, web pages or whatever this could be, should be encoded in the right format as well, 
because if you don't encode it, you're effectively opening up um, because the browser will effectively execute something that, that could be a script. So you want to encode your output so that the browser then cannot uh, execute it in any form. Um, and if you do these two things, you, you close off a whole range of you know, injection attacks that, that are predominantly the way to sort of, uh, you know, for attackers to, to get into your web application. Uh, character encoding, extremely tricky topic. I think even the, you know, the best developers uh, uh, stumble on this at times um, because it's, it's extremely tricky. You know, if you're dealing with the ASCII set, very easy. There's no nuances, no edge cases. Uh, but as soon as you get into Unicode, then there's a whole range of uh, attack vectors that open up. So a simple example is, you know, you're, you're probably doing uppercase, lowercase comparisons, uh, and that's very standard, right? Every application has that. Uh, but there's actually character set collisions within the Unicode um, character set, which you may not be obviously uh, aware of. Uh, a classic example is if you take the German character, um, it sort of, when you lowercase it, it becomes uh, a, a, a double S. And what that effectively means is, uh, is, you know, if you're comparing two strings, comparing the lowercase of them, you could have collisions. Uh, and that has huge impact on uh, essentially, effectively around, you know, emails, um, because emails are the way to sort of, you know, uniquely identify accounts in a, any system. So we'll take this example of you know, email normalization. Um, most companies take an email, normalize it in some form, uh, either uppercase or lowercase it, and store that in the database. And then when the user logs in, their email is again you know, either lowercase or uppercase and compared with, um, uh, with what they have in their database. Uh, and this is a big problem because if uh, someone identified a character set that can collide with an existing email on your system, they could, you know, use that to get into your system. Uh, and this has actually happened with, uh, with GitHub where a security researcher found a vulnerability. Uh, I think it was the Turkish eye, which looks like an eye, but is, is not an eye, but the, the two of them collide. Um, I think when you, when you lowercase it. Uh, so what happened was you could, you could use um, an email from another domain, uh, go to your password reset uh, UI, and then use that email to, to reset the password. And then it ended up sending the email to the, um, to, 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 the, to the new email that you entered, which is actually a collision with the other one, because uh, GitHub, of course, thinks that they're the same account, when in reality, it isn't. So you can see that you know very sort of you know, these edge cases that uh, very hard to think about, very hard to know about, uh, can cause these sorts of um, uh, attacks. Of course, you know the, the probability is quite low because you you need to have that exact collision uh, with an existing email um, on your system. But if you're a very popular system, this is this is quite um, this is quite normal and natural, like with GitHub. Um, and of course, you know, these, these typically lead to uh, account takeover attacks. Uh, then of course, you know, password reset uh, in a similar fashion, as I described earlier, there's a few things you need to do when resetting password, uh, which otherwise simply opens up uh, a vulnerability where you could end up sending that, you know, because the reset password ends up sending a URL to change your password. And if you end up sending it to the wrong email, you're essentially giving access to the to the to, to your user's account to somebody else. Um, so that you know that character set collision results in uh, in account takeovers. Uh, so a simple way to you know avoid most problems with password reset is always send uh, the password reset request to the email that you have on your system, and never to the one that the user entered or the one you normalized. Because at least that then ensures no matter what happens on this side, uh, only your original user is getting the email, and um, he can then you know he he can then know that it wasn't him that requested, and you can sort of you know will report back to you. Because if you do end up sending it to the wrong email, you have effectively given up ownership of that account. 
because you know they can come and reset the password, take over the account, change emails, and do do other things that that then sort of you know completely takes over the account. Uh, so that's you know one single uh, thing you can do well with password reset is always use the email on your system, never anything else. Uh, another classic one that I've also sort of in the past been um, you know bitten by is managing secrets. Uh, you know I used to throw that in, in the source code, right? Easiest place to drop it in. Uh, you hard code it somewhere, and then you quickly realize that you know staging is using the same secret, uh, production is using the same secret, and you know, all your alpha environments are using the same secret. So uh, just don't do that, you know, try and keep that away, use environment variables and pass it in, in the right way. Uh, because the other problem is if source code does leak in some form, then your secrets go with it. So you effectively expose your entire system on the back of that. Uh, and this actually happened in our team once, one of the engineers, accidentally published an npm uh, package which was meant to be private but uh, he ended up publishing it because he thought he was publishing another library and that had certificates and you know all of these sort of things in the source code so we effectively ended up having to test our you know disaster recovery scenario recycle all the certificates uh, they were used for jwts so we then had to recycle all our jwt tokens um, and, you know, it just ended up being quite messy in, at the end of the day. Um, good, you know, good test of our disaster recovery process, but, but not recommended. Um, and along the same lines, you're, you're constantly logging, you're writing to console, uh, so you don't want to accidentally leak secrets in there. So do watch out for what you're logging. Um, and wherever possible, try and, you know, use a masker on top of your logger. Plenty of libraries available, which will you know try and detect the patterns of these secrets, and then uh, try to mask it if you accidentally put it into your logs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, use you know environment variables for your secrets, and the best thing to do here is use something like HashiCorp Vault or one of the cloud services to manage your secrets. Uh, extremely useful, uh, actually not just in production, but you know for your other environments as well, because you can segregate them. You can keep it isolated and you can cycle them very quickly if something were to happen. Uh, logging, as I mentioned, you know, PI leakage in logs, definitely watch out for that. Uh, and the most important thing, as we saw with log4j, uh, don't allow any kind of code execution in logs because that opens up a whole bunch of vulnerability attacks um, like we saw with log4j. So the best thing to do there is, you know, treat logs as just string and then, you know, nothing else. Uh, handling sensitive data, very important, you know, PI data, you want to uh, firstly store only what you need. So if there's something you're collecting from your customer that you don't really need, you're better off just not you know, collecting it and storing it. Um, encrypt it at rest. You definitely want to use some kind of encryption algorithm. AES, 128 AES, 256 is, is highly recommended. Um, encrypt it at rest, keep the secret away from your system. That way, if you're ever hacked, you're just uh, leaking, you know, ciphertext data, um, and there's not much a hacker can do with it. Uh, you want to use TLS for transport so that it's encrypted end to end. There's uh, there's no risk of you know a man in the middle attack, and you absolutely want to lay out good and strict access control around the sensitive data, uh, making sure that you know only people who really need access to it are given access to it. Uh, Third-party libraries, we're all aware, you know, open source, uh, we're using more and more of that these days. Um, you want to check for outdated, unmaintained libraries. You want to check for vulnerabilities on them. Um, you want to automate these things in CI/CD and not, you know, have to worry about it manually. Uh, you know, plenty of tooling available around this today. So, you know, utilize that, bake it into your CI/CD pipelines. Um, and But most importantly, you want to have tests so that if you're updating libraries, you can be certain that you don't break your system. And this is quite important because it's a catch friendly to what happens is I've done this in the past as well, right? Uh, I've, I've used a library, I just don't want to update it because it comes with so much headache. You know, the APIs might have changed. Uh, I don't know where exactly it's used. So if you have good tests around this, then you know you can update the library, let CI/CD run the tests, and you're fairly certain that uh, 
uh, it doesn't break anything. And you're also then up to date with uh, in terms of security. So testing that way goes hand in hand with security. The more tests you have, um, you don't need to have 100%, of course, that's, that's always hard, but you wanna have enough for the critical bits so that you can keep your libraries updated, you can keep your uh, you know, systems updated, operating systems, so that um, uh, one, of course, you're up to date, and two, you're not actually breaking a system, your system, on the back of these updates. Um, and finally, you know, be secure by default. Um, this is this is very interesting. It's and it kind of is a bit of psychology as well. Um, your design choices dictate your the security of your system ultimately. Um, so I'll give you an example of you know how this works. Um, so MongoDB, when you know in the initial days, uh, as they were getting popular, for ease they turned off authentication by default. So what this meant was, you know, they wanted to make it easier for developers to uh, try MongoDB, you know, make sure it works, not have to worry about, you know, authentication uh, to the database itself. Uh, and the second thing they had was they connected to the uh, to the address 000 when, uh, you know, uh, this the MongoDB started. And 0000 means, you know, connect to a public interface as well. So what happened was developers or traditionally not used to you know infrastructure and um, and devops ended up you know hosting these uh, mongodb instances which then was basically open to the uh, to the public and it's a well known port 27017 so you had lots of bots going out there and uh, looking for this port as soon as they saw an open port they basically you know downloaded all the data deleted it and you know started asking for ransom around this uh, so they suspect that about, you know, 28,000 plus databases were, were exposed this way. Uh, and of course, you know, later version MongoDB patched that up and had authentication on by default. Uh, but you can see that a design choice that, you know, they made affected um, security as a whole, because, you know, uh, whatever is by default, you should assume that developers will end up uh, using that by default and not really change that. Um, so in a similar fashion, you know, don't, when you give your documentation examples, try not to include anything in there that's actually kind of real because you will end up, you know, developers copy pasting it and then just leaving it there, which effectively means, you know, a security key used in your doc will end up being the security key for a lot of production systems out there, uh, which is invariably a security uh, hole. Uh, and in the same way, you know, default username passwords, again, very risky. So, uh, you know, like the routers normally have, uh, if you do that on your server, for instance, you're invariably going to get um, um, attacked. I wanted to talk a little bit about compliance and regulations because, you know, they uh, inherently are tied with security quite closely. Um, the reality is that you know a lot of companies would not do would not take security uh, seriously if the compliance and regulatory frameworks on top were not sort of mandating it. Um, so so you know what what they are effectively is a set of guidelines, best practices. Uh, there's there's whole research bodies around this that are responsible for these compliance and regulatory frameworks, uh, and the intention is very simple, right? They want to make sure. Uh, companies that have sort of, you know, taken a lot of uh, data um, uh, under their wings are doing the best things to sort of protect that data. And that's what it is really about, right? Because you, uh, as we saw, 100% security is always uh, utopia. So by doing this, they're ensuring that um, companies can stay on top of, um, of security. And it's an ongoing process. Uh, it effectively you know, never ends. You know, just because you have a certification um, or a regulation done, it doesn't mean it's actually done. You, your entire company is sort of uh, continuously sort of ensuring that uh, it's it's maintained over time. Uh, very much like software is right. Uh, software is never done. Neither is security around software. Um, and it's not just the engineering team that is responsible for this, um, including you know, your compliance and regulatory frameworks. Um, the entire company is typically involved. Uh, it cuts across various departments um, because you know, if you think about sales, marketing, they're dealing with sensitive data as well. 
So they need to be aware of uh, the same set of things that, that engineers are aware of. Um, and this typically also involves a lot of training. Uh, so companies will roll out training specifically for departments and also generic ones across the, the company. Um, so some classic examples are ISO 27001, uh, SOC 2, these two are very popular with B2B companies. At some point in their journey, they need to get compliant with, with one or both of these um, uh, compliance frameworks. GDPR, everybody's aware now. Um, uh, you have to safeguard your customers' data. Uh, and it's no longer just a European thing either, right? It started there, but now uh, pretty much worldwide, there's been various data regulations that are modeled around GDPR and modified to suit the local, um, the local market. Uh, and then there's uh, vertical specific regulatory frameworks as well. Uh, example is PCI in the finance industry. If you're dealing with uh, payment cards, you have to be PCI compliant. Uh, and HIPAA, which is for uh, you know, um, healthcare startups that are dealing with uh, health related data. Extremely important to safeguard that because there's a whole lot of privacy issues around leaking uh, you know, health information of your patients. Um, so, that's, so that's sort of where you know, security blends with these. You've got compliance and regulatory frameworks dictating another top and then companies implementing the security guidelines underneath this. Um, so, so some final notes around you know, what what we just spoke about. Uh, so the idea was to give everyone a sense of what security entails. As you can see, it's quite vast. Um, it was impossible for me to cover, uh, you know, a lot of topics there that I uh, that I'd love to have. Uh, but hopefully, you know, the talk has sort of you know inspires you to think about security uh, a lot more as you go on about your day to day operations. Um, but you know, if you think about it, security really at the end of the day is, is about risk management, and that is how companies deal with it. Uh, that is how compliance frameworks are built as well. Uh, it's not something you can set and forget. You essentially have to set it and then maintain it and tweak it and iterate on it. Um, and risk management is effectively these uh, essentially these things, right? You you look at the probability of this attack happening or vulnerability. Um, or, or something that you know, your company or product is exposed to, and you weigh it against the severity of this. So if that happens or if that comes true, what is the impact on your company, on your business? Um, um, and then once you weigh those two, it helps you prioritize uh, which ones to look at first and which ones you can actually ignore as well. Because you know, if something is very low probability and very low severity, uh, it's probably okay for the time being to not worry about it. So that's how you know companies model their um, information security and uh, and compliance processes around this. Um, and 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 effectively, uh, compliance is a way to reflect your your company's security process because technically, no one can come in and and do a full audit of all your systems. They can take slices, they can you know, uh, broadly look into what you're doing. And that's what these compliance frameworks cover. Uh, so you're effectively saying, you know, I take security seriously, this is the process I've laid out, uh, and this is how I'm trying to mitigate all the risk associated with my, with my company and product. Uh, so, so lastly, for us developers, you know, what we need to do is there's a lot of complexity out there, which is perfectly fine. Try and keep it simple. Uh, you want to use it as a you know a ladder or a step process where you want to only lay out uh, as much as is needed for your company uh, for the next stage, and then sort of you know build on top of that, right? So you want to start small and then sort of expand on it. Uh, so the you know the best thing you can do is make sure you sort of take up security reviews along with your code reviews. Uh, that's a very good place to start. And then from there, you sort of, you know, expand out and um, start to lay it out in, you know, the rest of your development process um, could be, you know, CI, CD, um, could be deployment. Um, and then, of course, you know, cross department collaboration over time as well.
Uh, and there's there's a final slide with some useful resources, um, uh, which which are extremely good to you know just get started around this. Um, OWASP and SNCC has a lot of uh, documentation around this. Very good cheat sheets where they cover you know every aspect of security and what you can do around that. Uh, Auth zero has some very good uh, coverage of the common vulnerabilities around it as well. Uh, and some very good examples of, you know, uh, real life vulnerabilities that have been documented. Um, and of course, you know, where possible, try and use a, use a, you know, a good open source, well-maintained library around authentication, authorization, because that then, you know, offloads all of your uh, security responsibilities because, you know, they take care of it for you. Uh, but barring that, of course, you know, you want to make sure you are covered as well uh, with with the things that you do. Um, and thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the, the talk and I'm around for any questions that may come up.